Hello, everyone. Nice to uh, see uh, people here to, eager to learn. Um, we're going to be talking today about material that's in a new book called Activity Matters. You, it's available through the Child and Youth Care website, CYCNet, the bookstore there. It's, um, it's just been published, so it's a brand new um, kind of a, a piece. And again, as, as Annie said, it's about uh, working with play and recreation <clears throat> to help people to um, to learn how to how to live well. So the the title of the book Activity Matters is is kind of a, obviously a double um, meaning. Activity is very important, and and as we look at it, there are lots of details around activity. So why don't we get started? So we talk about play. Hang on, just a sec. Okay, so when we talk about play, we all have experienced play. And at the same time, we all have very unique feelings about it. each of us kind of approaches play in our own way based on again, our own childhood, um, some of our own experiences with being involved in playing. Most of us enjoy playing. But again, there are certain things about it that we may or may not like. So Playing may seem like a simple thing, but it, it can be very complex, um, particularly for people who are um, who are worried about being safe or how they come across or whether they're good enough, um, whether they've had experience with this particular kind of playing before that was enjoyable or not. So it, it can be very complex, and we're going to try to look at how we can understand play in a way that makes it very useful for us to um, to work with play. One of the things that I think people who work with young people know is that play is a great place to connect with uh, with people. Uh, people who work with families too, when you do something enjoyable with a family, it's, it's a way to get closer to them, to have them feel like it's okay to be around you. So that whole idea that, <clears throat> that play is an excellent way to, to make connections with people is, is really very important. One of the things that we want you to look at as a, a child and youth care worker is that your own attitude about play is very important. You need to be aware of, um, of your own kind of issues as you engage in play with people. And you've really got to also be aware of how is the other person experiencing what you're doing? Are they enjoying it or is, is it working for them? Is this the right kind of um, challenge or if you want or, or, or a fun thing for them to do. So as we look at working with play and knowing that it's an excellent way to connect, we also have to be aware that things are going on for us when we engage in play. Similarly, things are going on for the other person and we may, we may need to be really clear about what's going on for both of you. So as you are very familiar in South Africa and everywhere else, child and new care work is about being in the life space, that we're not sitting in an office, um, you, know, you know, talking across a desk. We're actually interacting with people in a very direct way in their lives. And that um, life space work can be very intrusive. <clears throat> a lot of times what we find ourselves as we do life space work is people feel like we're kind of pushing into their life and, uh, and, and intruding. The good thing about play is it naturally occurs in the life space and it's an easily shared space. Like people are okay with us playing with them much more than they are with us coming into their home as a guest or um, working with them in a very um, direct way around uh, problems or issues. So. Play is a much more natural way to do life space work, which is very, makes it very useful. As a child and youth care worker, you have, find yourself, as you use play, you both introduce and lead activities, and other times you follow the activity, you join the activity and someone else is, um, is leading it or the activity doesn't need a leader. So you've got that dual possibility of just being a participant as well as many times needing to be the leader. People who work with particularly um, um, 
young people who are, who are struggling with being powerful know that sometimes letting the, um, the young person teach you a new sport or skill or activity can be very powerful. They, they feel like they know something that you need as opposed to us always doing things to them or with them. And letting them teach you and other young people new skills is a great way to give them kind of center stage and let them shine. So play can be a great place to do that. Let people feel like um, um, th that they're, they're important. Play is also a great place to introduce new ideas, new experiences. That whole idea of you can learn a lot as you engage in play. And it's, an, it's a very non-threatening way to learn. It's a, you're learning through actually having fun, which is, um, a, again, a very easy way for them to, uh, to engage with you. And what we find as we uh, engage in um, in life space work and using activities is that we're really sharing the life space rather than it being our life space. So people who work, for example, in, the, in residential care know that the young person is very aware that this isn't their home and that you're the boss and all that. Um, people that come into an office feel like, you know, they're not, this is not a natural place for them to be. So when we engage in play, often we mutually own the, the place we're playing. The playground doesn't belong to anyone, you know, and we're just both using it together. So it's a really a nice, it's a nice life space um, um, approach, nice life space method to use play to engage in people's lives with them without it being um, too intrusive and too much of we be, we're powerful and they're the, the kind of client, if you want. So. So one of the things you have to be very aware of as a child and youth care worker is that you are really in a leadership position. That it re there are lots of responsibilities that you have as someone engaging in play, as the adult, as the uh, professional that you need to be kind of tuned into. The biggest thing is you're always responsible for the safety of the, uh, of, of the activity. So you want to be sure that all of the people engaged in the playing activity are feeling safe. So you're responsible for creating a safe environment for them. You also need to be sure that the equipment is safe and that the playground area itself is safe. So it's very important as a child and youth care worker that the young people and the families that we engage in our work with they expect us to be in charge of making things safe for them. So you need to be safe yourself too. So in many ways, if you're engaged in an activity that you're uncomfortable with, it's not going to be safe for you or anybody else. So as you engage in, whether it's a sport or a game or a kind of an artistic thing, you have all these group dynamics going on if you have more than one person involved besides you. And you really must, you need to manage the opportunities for everybody to participate. It's really up to you, the child and youth care worker, to make sure that one or two people aren't dominating um, the, the activity or, um, or, or that some of the young people aren't feeling bad because they're not as good as the other people. So that whole idea that you're, in, you're really uh, responsible for the group dynamics. You're responsible for that participation of each person so that everyone feels fully engaged. And that's, that's part of, again, a very complex leadership role that you have. You also are involved with time management, when to begin, uh, when to shift focus, and when to end the activity. And, and again, that whole idea that when you manage time well, the the, the ability for people to have fun and, uh, and, and finish well is, um, is very important. And that whole idea of one of the nice things about playing is that everyone has got skills in terms of playing and that um, 
you can use play to make sure that people who don't feel very capable or powerful can suddenly get that experience of um, of being important, being powerful. Um, so again, that, that in that leadership role, you you have to constantly be monitoring how you can use the activity to create these moments for different people. So let's look at sports, which is one of the more obvious kind of play things. Okay, so many people enjoy sports, but some people don't. And you need to be clear that some people have actually some very bad experiences with sports in terms of not being picked for teams or not being good enough or being laughed at. So. Sports are one of those interesting activities where the particular sport that you're engaged in can have lots of emotional kind of baggage for different people. Um, and again, some people in, in certain sports feel like, well, I should be the captain or because I'm the best and all that kind of thing. So again, sports are, are an easy way to start having fun, but they also can be a difficult way for some people. One of the biggest problems I find with using sports with the young people I work with is competition can be a real problem for them. Many of the young people I've worked with feel like they, they're not good at things. They're always kind of a loser. And competition really reinforces that because they lose. They, don't, they often don't win. Even when they win, they just think it was because they were lucky, not because they were any good. So that whole idea that as we engage in sports, most sports are almost automatically set up to be competitive. And we have to be clear that that may not be a good thing for most of the young people that, that we're working with. And that as much as possible, we have to try to reduce that competition angle as we engage in sports with people. So you can reduce the competitiveness in a sport by changing how it's being played. Um, so one of the things that I found is lots of the games that the sports that we uh, know, we just automatically play them the way they get played competitively, when really we could, we could adjust some of those activities to make them much less competitive. So in lots of ways, we can change things to make the, the, the goal of the activity of the sport to be cooperative rather than competitive. So just for example, to play like a volleyball game, instead of trying to score points by making the other team miss the ball, you can have a goal of saying, let's see how many volleys we can have together. Let's try to get, let's try to keep the ball up in the air for 20 times and have, have everyone basically cooperating with each other to not let the ball hit the ground. And so things like that where like you can, change the rules of things to make it much more of a let's all help each other um, rather than than let's try to beat the other team or the other person that whole idea that winning and losing experiences are not particularly fun for most of you for many young people that in fact we have to understand that as the leader in an activity the more we can de-emphasize who won and who lost while still keeping the activity interesting can be very important. I mean, lots of young people immediately say it's going to be boring if, there's, if nobody wins. And you say, well, let's give it a try. And, and lots of times you can shift that focus from winning and losing into, um, into really just enjoying the activity and enjoying being with other people. So I want you to think about what sports do you enjoy? Like we all have kind of sports that we really in, have fun with. And most of it's because we're good at it, um, that we've had some good experiences with it, um, that it's easy for us to kind of do whatever sport it is. But again, as you think about it, there are lots of sports that you don't think are fun. It's too difficult or the equipment is, isn't available to you or you just don't know anybody that does that. Why would you want to do that? So one of the things we need to think about is that's true for most people. There are some things they enjoy and some things they don't enjoy. One of the things I found to be a problem with 
child and youth care workers is they often try to introduce to the young people the sports that they, as the adult, the sports that they enjoy. And the young people may not, would, wouldn't have chosen that sport, but because the adult's comfortable with it, they, 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 they make the young people kind of play it with them. And so we have to be careful to say, we each have our own kind of preferences around different sports and we need to be aware of why do we like that sport and is that a good reason for that young person to like that sport so it's always good to share your enthusiasm about doing things but again to be careful not to kind of be too um, 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 pushy if you want with you know i want you to kind of learn how to do this because i enjoy doing it um, there, and there are lots of sports that everybody plays. You know, you get a sport like uh, soccer, football, and uh, you just assume everybody's going to enjoy it. Well, some people don't. You know. So we often use board games too to work with people. And again, it's a it's an excellent way to work with people. It's a it's a great way to communicate. You're sitting there together, often talking while you're playing the games about other things. So board games can be a great way to connect and to find out more about people. Um, again, some board games are easy to learn, some are more complicated. And you have to kind of think about what's a, what's a good game for the, this particular person or this group of people to play that won't be too hard for them or won't be too easy for them to, so that they're bored with it. So that whole idea of kind of finding the right fit for the, the group in terms of the difficulty of the game. Here's one of the problems that I, I laugh, but it's, it's almost always true. Adults, particularly people who play board games a lot, they need to win. And they get, they get actually very competitive with the young people they're playing the game with. And we have to be careful not to do that. I mean, that, that's really not a useful thing to do is to need to be the winner and, you know, kind of call people out for, well, that's cheating because you're not supposed to do it that way. And Because we have this need to kind of be good at things that we have to kind of put aside when we're using play with young people. Our own skill level and, uh, and, and if you want scoreboard in our own minds about how good we are, it needs to kind of um, be put on the side as we use board games to work with people. It's much more important to be a good loser than to be a good winner as the adult. So some of the things you can do with board games to make them more enjoyable for young people and, and, and take the, if you want, who's best at this kind of out of the game is having teams play the game as teams. So it's not just um, each person individually. You can have rules like you, if you don't know the answer, you can ask a friend, you know, like that old uh, TV show where you can call somebody. Um, and you can give hints when people um, are stuck, they, they can get two or three hints, you know, that kind of thing. So that makes the game more fun and less kind of who's the best at this kind of a thing. And I find that if you can create board game activities that really help people learn information that they need to know, but they would be very reluctant to read a book or do it as homework, you know. So that whole idea of having, um, of using games, whether it's um, um, information that, that the game will kind of gradually help them uh, learn or learning how to kind of be strategic about how to memorize things or put things in order. So Games can be a good way to teach people new information in a fun way. So again, we can we should think of those kinds of things too. So again, one of the things that I think child and youth care workers, particularly in South Africa, do very well is to use a cre what we call creative activities with young people, dancing, music, art. And again, a, a very powerful way to not only connect with people, but get to know them better, to understand how they feel, what they think. So it's a very, it's a really very uh, helpful way to play with people, um, getting them to be expressive and really expressing some of your own ideas in a, in, a, in a very easy to kind of listen to way. So when you draw a picture and 
young people see some of what you're expressing, you, you get to, you know, kind of be closer to them by talking about yourself a bit, as well as listening to them as they do it. Many of the young people I work with are much better at telling you how they feel or think through being creative, through music, dance, singing, um, uh, than they, they would be trying to sit down and talk about themselves. Um, the safe parks are a good example of um, having, having young people use memory boxes. Um, we talk about doing life books where you make a scrapbook of your life so far and where you're going to go as you grow up, you know, drawing and making pictures, and providing um, different artistic ways of, of putting your, um, your life out there for, you know, for you to understand better and for other people to see. The, uh, the whole idea of using dance and group singing, a great way to create good group dynamics in a, in a group of young people. They, they really feel as part of a group very easily. They, um, they find their, if you want, their spot in the group, um, how it all fits together. And they, all, and they are much more willing to help each other um, in those kinds of activities than they would be if they were competing. And again, one of the things that is very important working with young people, particularly in, um, in the context of South Africa with so many different cultural groups is really um, getting people to get in touch with their culture through traditional games and things like that. That Again, I think my experience is that I've seen people do it very well in the, in the safe parks. So play is a very complex and important activity and the, the adult, the child and youth care worker is um, is really a key person in kind of making play something that is helpful, useful, um, and really kind of structured in a way that people can uh, have fun at the same time they're doing something that's important, you know, and and building that connection. So let's take a look at the safe park um, um, process just as as one good example of using play in a very um, uh, well-organized way. So the Issy Bindi programs have activity as a connecting point for young people to connect with, uh, with the program, with the Issy Bindi program. And it's a good way for you to connect with families as in a, a secondary way. As you get to know the young people, you get to know which families need help and you can gradually kind of work your, your connection with the young person in the safe park into getting into their home and helping their families. So it's a great, it's a great place for people to start to get connected where otherwise you may not run into them easily. I just think the name is a great name. It automatically should help people feel more safe. It's a place, it's a park you can go to and feel safe. I think that's it. I don't know who it came up with the name Safe Park, but it's a beautiful um, kind of a name for that, that whole um, structure. One of the things that we talked about a long time ago with the Safe Parks is that when you fence the area in or put a bunting or a border around the activity area, like for some of the uh, safe parks that are temporary in the uh, townships, um, it creates a sense of safety. One of the things that um, researchers found years ago is that if you have a playground without a fence, young people only play in the center of the area. They don't, they don't use the whole area. But when you put a fence around it, they'll use the whole area because now the whole place is safe not just uh, the, the middle of it. And that whole idea of um, creating a border around your safe park to say, when you're physically inside this boundary, you can, you can believe that you're safe. Very important. So most of the safe parks I've visited um, have sports fields. Uh, some, many of them have gardens. Um, some have libraries for homework and uh, things like that and provide food and have a playground with um, 
you know, slides and seesaws and monkey bars and things like that. And again, lots of good places to create play moments. So child and youth care workers working in a particular safe park have lots of, if you want, um, equipment and, um, and, and programs that they can start to use. You have lots of board games, tables to sit in and play uh, board games, you know, all of that. Um, so the, the safe park structure, the physical structure is, is very conducive to, again, creating those play moments in many different ways with many different kinds of activities. And again, the thing that's important is it's not just um, a space with equipment. I mean, the, really the thing that makes the safe park work well is the child and youth care workers who bring those children in in a welcoming way, who start by having a, uh, a circle where everyone feels included, um, uh, the singing, the, um, the games where people kind of um, have fun immediately by being part of the group, um, the way the child and youth care workers kind of work with individual young people around activities. Um, so the whole idea that Safe Park is a great um, physical situation, but it only works well because the child and youth care workers know how to use it well. And then one of the things about the Safe Park that I found to be quite powerful is it's a great way for people to start to make introductions into families that otherwise might not even be noticed in the community, as well as families that might be more reluctant to have someone come into their home. Now that they know that you know their children, they're much more willing to let you kind of um, be interested in the, in the rest of the family. So again, the safe park is, a, is really a very nice kind of um, um, methodology, if you want, to um, to work with people and build those connections. And again, it's really clearly using play and activity as a way to do that. So here's where I, we're gonna kind of get a little bit um, um, more theoretical. I, I want you to now kind of think of, um, we've talked about play and we've talked about the experience of play and most of us have played lots and that's the way we work with kids. But I want you to kind of spend some time with me now looking at, there actually is some theoretical kind of understandings that will help us to direct our energies in a very deliberate way as we use play. So people who've had difficult lives, either they may have suffered abuse or been neglected, been traumatized by death and uh, food insecurity and all the rest of the negative things that can happen to the um, young people and families that we work with. They, as they have all those experiences, they, they develop a real negative worldview, a negative story about themselves that it's very hard to kind of um, resist. They, um, they look around and say, why is this, why has this happened to me? And, and they really came up with all kinds of um, stories about, I'm not good enough, um, I must be unlucky, um, I must be a bad person, um, all those kinds of things. So again, a lot of the young people we work with really are, they're not very positive about themselves. They don't see themselves as, as having lots of opportunities to be successful. Their past experiences being often being powerless, not having the ability to resist being neglected or abused. <clears throat> they see themselves as not being able to get close to other people because it's not a good thing to do to get to trust other people or get connected to people because they, they use that kind of connection to, um, to take advantage of you. Um, they have a lot of pain in their lives. They have a lot of loss or distress that um, has been their experience of life so far. And, and in many ways, it creates a, a kind of a hopelessness that why, why would I think that it's ever going to get any better? Like it, 
it really, I'm just one of those people that life is not going to treat well. And there's no point in thinking it's going to get any better. So what happens is, with that past story being so powerful, what happens is their picture of the future is also pretty negative. Like, it's not going to get any better. Like, my life is going to be like this. It's going to, in fact, it probably will get worse. Um, so my, my story about the past is based on my experience, but my story about the future is based on my belief that my experience is not going to change. Uh, I look at my older siblings or my parents and, you know, I think that's going to be me, you know. Um, there's no point in, in, um, in trying too hard. So that whole idea that there's no reason to think that things are going to get better. I got it just the way it is. So what happens is that past story and that future story prevent them from believing that anything will change. So what happens is that they say, well, there's no point in putting any effort into being different because it's not going to be any different. So what happens is there's no ability to live in the present moment. So most of us, you think about um, people say to you, well, you know, turn the page. Now you have a clean slate. You can do whatever you want to change things. You know, you can start tomorrow with a clean page to write a new story for yourself, go on a diet, you know, learn a new skill, um, go back to school, uh, get a new job. The problem is that many of the people that I've worked with, they don't have the ability to do that. They just don't believe that that's one of the choices that they have. They just think it's not. So one of the things for, if you work with families, one of the experiences many uh, family workers have is that they'll go into a, a home and see the need for you know, going out and getting um, food vouchers or, um, or going getting medical help or you know, getting school programs set up. And while they're with that mother or father or, or, or a young person, teenager, that person will go with you and get the food they need or, um, or enroll in the programs you want them to or get the medical care that they should get. But when you uh, contact them a week later and say, did you go back and do that again? They say, well, no, I just couldn't get around to it. I was, you know, I didn't, I was too busy. I was too tired. And, and we get frustrated with that. But what I think we need to kind of be aware of is that They'll only do something like that because you are kind of with them, that they don't have enough ability to live in the present. In other words, to make those changes in their life on their own because they just feel like I don't have any hope that things are going to be different. So that they're really not being, they're not resisting what we want them to do in the sense of being, um, saying it wasn't a good idea. They just don't have that ability to live in the present to make those changes in their life. So again, they continue with this play theory. So how do you use play to work with people who, uh, who feel that way? So playing in many ways creates a sense of being in a place free of the usual issues of life. Often when we're playing, we let go of um, all of the other things that are bothering us or making us feel wonderful. We just kind of, be, we're in a, a clean, if you want, place where you can just play. Um, so that, that makes play a very, in many ways, a very useful place for us to work. Because again, we have that negative story about the past and the future has less influence on a person while they're playing. So our goal is to, use play to create what I call a free space where the negative story is forgotten for a while. So as people are playing, they're 
negative story about what's going to happen next and what's happened so far to me loses a lot of its kind of um, power. And they, uh, they, they know it'll be there when they stop playing. But for right now, it, it's kind of forgotten. So when people are in that free place, new opportunities are possible. I can be different in this free place. Now, one of the things that happens for many of the young people I've worked with and the families is when they're playing and do something that's fun or successful and they suddenly feel uh, powerful or lucky or, um, or good at things, they'll almost immediately um, excuse it. Well, that was just luck or, you know, that wasn't me. Um, they'll kind of, because their negative story jumps in very quickly, like, don't try to get too hopeful. Don't try to think you're too good at things, you know? So we have to kind of be aware that as people are in this ability to enjoy themselves, they also need us to be with them to kind of highlight or support them to believe that that really happened. So we had, there was an interesting article written quite a while ago now by Kathy Scott, who works with you all. Um, and she talked about, we really need to spend more time um, helping, being with kids as they score a soccer goal, as they catch a fish, as they draw a picture that they enjoy and, and help them feel um, good about life, good about themselves, rather than doing things to them like anger management groups and, you know, uh, writing, um, you know, down your goals for the future. Like we, we, we end up as we do that negative, you know, trying to prevent them from being bad, if you want, we're doing things to them where when we enjoy them being powerful or having fun free of, you know, all their problems, we're, we're doing things with them. So again, very important that that free place has to be uh, mutually kind of shared, both the, the child care worker and the, and the young person or family. So when we create that free place experience, we're creating a feeling of being in the present not controlled by the past or the future. We're just trying to be as, if you want, as in the moment as possible as we create this, um, this, this kind of free place activity. So when people are in that free place, they can feel powerful. They can feel like I really can do this. I'm really kind of skilled or talented. They can really feel hopeful. Like, wow, that was, um, I didn't think I could do that. And something I didn't, never kind of imagined myself being good at. Look at that. And they also feel like connected to you better because now we both experience me being powerful, fun, um, you know, all of that. So as we create this free place moments with young people, we're creating all kinds of opportunities to get closer to them and have them feel closer to us, lots of moments of hopefulness, of feeling powerful. So again, it's very important to anchor those feelings as they're occurring, because they'll very quickly get dismissed by people with that negative story about themselves. So one of the things I want you to think about, your job description, if you want, if someone says, well, what do you actually do? Um, you know, you talk about helping kids, blah, blah. What do you actually do? I want you to think about your job as you are an experience arranger. Your job is to create life space moments when the young person has physical and emotional exposure to feelings of hope or joy or connection. So what you're really trying to do all the time is in the life space, create moments, sometimes very quick moments, sometimes moments that last um, a while of people having different feelings about themselves, different thinking about themselves, different physical experiences that change the way they feel, that make them feel hopeful or happy or just 
happy to be close to us. So that whole idea that our job is not to counsel people, it's not to talk them out of their problems, it's to help them experience life with us in a way that's different from what they've experienced. One of the things that I think child needs care workers know, but often don't say clearly enough, is that we use actions, not words, to work with people. We communicate with people through doing things, through being with them, not through sitting and talking about how does it feel to do that, you know. Um, we, we want to have these young people we work with and the families get new information. Like there is some things I'm good at, that I can be hopeful, that people, some people are safe to be closer and more connected to, through actually experiencing them rather than being told to think that way. So that whole idea that we're speaking to people's hearts and not their minds is very important. Some of the more recent kind of um, neuroscience uh, discoveries, if you want, or research is based on when a young person is, has been neglected or abused or traumatized early on in their life, their brain, their physical brain literally creates and blocks different neural pathways in their brain. And one of the ways their brain changes is that they, <clears throat> they lose the ability to think about things in a certain way. So they, they lose the ability to trust people. Like physically their brain stops them from thinking you can trust people. They lose their ability to feel hopeful about themselves. And that in many ways, what we're trying to do is reopen some of those neural pathways, some of those physical parts of their brains to start to allow those kinds of thoughts in. The interesting thing is you can't do that by talking to them about it. Because when you're talking to them, that you're talking to their brain and their brain's already good at blocking that. So they just look at you and stare out the window, whatever, and, and just go on thinking what they're thinking. So as we talk to people's hearts, we override their brain's ability to block it. So as I feel hopeful, as I feel connected, my brain's saying, that's not a good thing to feel, but your body's saying, yeah, but I'm feeling it. So it must be true. And so what will happen is you create what we call a cognitive dissonance. In other words, your brain is kind of confused because you're experiencing something that your brain say, says, um, you shouldn't experience and it feels okay. So you're, you're gradually allowing your brain to create some new ways to think, but not by talking, you're actually doing it by doing it. So one of the things I want you to think about, you have young people who don't trust adults. And as you work with them, you find that they're more and more willing to be physically close to you, to, um, to be around you. And what's happening for them as they experience this safety and closeness that feels good when they're around you, you're sitting in the living room or a sitting in a, in a school room and that person comes and sits next to you because they feel good sitting next to you. And what's happening is their brain is saying, don't do that, people are dangerous. And their body's saying, yeah, but it feels good to sit next to you person. So again, we're, we're trying to create those experiences physically and emotionally that override their, their brain saying people are dangerous. So even as the negative story that the person has in their brain is trying to influence them, their body's feeling differently. And it's creating a very interesting and, and again, important way for us to help people change the way they are because we're creating the new possibilities that they haven't allowed in yet that now they can start to think about. So a very smart writer, Mark Krieger from the United States um, has written this. So it's, these aren't my ideas necessarily, though I certainly agree with them. 
said basically what child and youth care work is, is, is creating moments of connection, discovery, and empowerment for people. Very easy to think about, but very complex kind of thought. So the focus of our efforts as experience arrangers is to create moments of connection, discovery, and empowerment for people. So today we're talking about using play to do that. There are other ways to do it too, but this, we're using play as a, as a very useful, important way to create moments of connection, discovery, and empowerment. So as we interact with young people, as we create our recreational activities, as we engage in them with people, we have to reflect as we're doing it on, is what we're doing right now creating connection? Is it creating discovery? Is it creating people feeling more powerful? So that whole idea that, that as we purposely think about this is our goal, it will help us to direct our efforts much more in a much more useful way as we work with people. So when you win a card game and beat the other person to make them feel bad, it doesn't create a moment of connection, you know, that kind of thing. So play creates connection when we're enjoying it together. So it's for you sitting back and watching someone play, that doesn't create as much connection as when you're actually doing it with them. So I, I years ago wrote an article about your job as a child youth care worker, if you were in a swimming pool, is not to be in the lifeguard chair high above blowing a whistle and telling people to behave, but your job is to be in the water with them, splashing around and enjoying the swimming. So that whole idea that we need to be together and enjoy it together, not be kind of a guard or a monitor sitting outside. Discovery is a very important part of our recreational activities. As we um, use activities to create new information for people, to create new ways for them to learn skills, uh, can be very important and they, can, they really can build their ability to, um, to be more capable through learning new skills and ways to think. Um, so one of the things I think that we can do very nicely with activities is to help people feel more, more powerful, more, um, 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 more capable um, by being successful in, in, in doing activities, you know, and again, as you carefully plan activities and, and the, the leadership that's needed, um, you can really create those moments of connection, discovery and empowerment pretty uh, consciously um, for in many, many ways, you know, rather than just saying we have an hour to play, what do we want to do that takes an hour, you know. Okay, and again, I'm giving you lots of information here and we'll have some time. I'm, we're gonna spend some time in just a few minutes getting any questions and comments. But again, this is hopefully useful for you. So when you think of a safe park, and again, I'm using the safe park because hopefully many of you um, work in safe parks. Um, what I want you to think about is as these young people come into the safe park, they carry a backpack full of negative, stories on their back. They carry it around with them all the time. Um, and so what we want them to do in a, in, a, in a metaphorical way is to take that backpack off and hang it on a hook at the door of the safe park, because as they walk into the safe park, they should feel like, I don't need to carry this negative story here. This is a safe place. So I can let go of my negative story while I'm in the safe park. Again, I'm going to pick it up as I go home again. I mean, I'm not going to forget all these terrible things or, you know, my negative story. But for now, I don't have, doesn't have to be that burden on my back. So when I leave, I'll pick it back up off the hook and put it on. So that the safe park is a free place. 
It's a place where I can be free of some of those heavy burdens I carry. And I can let myself feel it's okay to be connected. I can let myself feel like I'm pretty good at stuff. I'm, I've got lots of skills. I can let myself feel like there's some hope here to be different. I can try to be different. So in many ways, our family work, as you use those connections with young people to work with families, in many ways, what you're really trying to do inside of people's homes, inside of their family dynamics, is to try to create a safe place in their home for themselves, a, a way for them within their own family and within their own uh, physical living situation to, to find places where they can feel safe. So it's very important to understand that just having a safe park, just having a playground in the middle of, of a village is not going to accomplish much, but that the child and youth care workers are the key ingredient in doing this, that you are actually building this dynamic and creating these experiences. You are the experience arrangers that are making this whole um, dynamic kind of possible. And again, it's through you thinking about what you're doing, thinking about how to um, create those safe park dynamics. So if you don't have a safe park to work with, you can create those dynamics in, in the cafeteria, in a schoolroom, or out on the playground. You can create it in, uh, in again, um, um, the, the residential center you're working in. You know, you can create a place for this to happen, you know, that kind of thing. But it, it's important to not only have that physical space, but to have that ability as a child and youth care worker to create that dynamic for people, to have them be able to come into this space with you and feel like this is a place I can let go of those problems. So again, I'm going to summarize this. We're almost at the end now. So when we look at being a child and youth care worker whose job is to arrange these experiences in um, in people's life spaces and doing it with them not to them so so the ingredients for supporting people to create these if you want safe activity places is you first have to create a sense of safety and trust so one of the important beginning spots is I, as the child and youth care worker, have to feel safe doing these activities. I have to feel like it's, I'm comfortable with it. But then I have to be able to help other people feel safe with doing the activity and being with me. So they have to trust that this is, that I'm good, that I can do this with them. We're using play because play, again, is that natural place where people can be more equal you know you don't you don't have that power relationship in play as much we also it's a place where people can let go of some of their worries and problems because play is just supposed to be fun so one of the things you want to do as you work in using activities is trying to match how that person sees themselves and the level of challenge presented so I want the activity to not be too difficult for them or too easy for them. I don't want them to feel like we're treating them like a baby, but I also don't want them to feel like, you know, I can't do that. So that whole idea of, of building into the sport or the game or the activity or the dance and singing activity, um, uh, a really a developmentally appropriate, if you want, um, level of challenge. The next thing I want to do is to arrange those play experiences so that that person feels that cognitive dissonance. So that I, they'll feel like, wait a minute, like this is really, this feeling is different than the way I think about myself. And maybe I need to kind of allow myself to be more hopeful or to see myself as more powerful. And again, the other important thing is, this is not just a one-time thing. You don't do this twice and the person suddenly changes. 
It's an ongoing, regular message every day that you're in the safe bar that just continues to build that, that I'm really very carefully constructing based on where you are right now so that you're gradually getting the story really embedded in your body so that you can use it on your own. So that's the end of my presentation and I'd like to leave it open. Someone be the mo moderator, I assume, to deal with questions and comments. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Let's uh, give him a round of applause. I can see there's the, the people are reaction, reactions there, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're part of your presentation, sharing their comments. They are like, uh, I would say, like junior lecturers here, also sharing what they understand and believe. And I like the comment of one of the uh, participants here says, the presentation reminds me about my work in Isibindi. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so uh, we will open it. Maybe there are, are some people uh, who would like to share their comments. Uh, or ask a question, and then uh, we will in between also uh, if uh, read some of the comments. If people, uh, you know, are uh, shy or somehow not uh, able to share, but uh, can we see by the the hands? I think Jack, uh, you have shared with us and taking us back in terms of the importance of our work. And I actually, from my side. Uh, we always hear, you know, around us people complaining about us as child and youth care workers not being able to articulate what is it that we do. And today you've given us so much uh, to put in our toolbox. And I like this new concept. It sounds so uh, 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 complex and, 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 and very educated that we can call ourselves an experience arranger. We still have to translate it in our 11 languages so that people can, can understand us better. <laughs> but uh, child and youth care workers, next time when you go to interviews and they ask you there, of course, it's mostly the social workers that sometimes are there, the managers and those people asking us these questions, then we must tell them we call ourselves experience arrangers. Jack has given us a new concept uh, to take take with us. And uh, can we uh, see who would like to uh, have a question? I don't see any hands here on my screen. Uh, let me go to the people. Uh, so El Elwin, let me make a comment if I could. Yes, yes, Jack. So this book is available <laughs> to CYC Net in the bookstore. And it includes all chapters on working in schools and working with um, a variety of different kinds of using outdoor activities. And so it's a, it's a very co comprehensive. I'm just giving you one of the chapters in the book today. So just so you know. Uh, so it means you'll have to come back next year and go through the other parts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, because you've only given us the starter. <clears throat> uh, I don't know if Zeni would like to perhaps also make a comment. Yeah, uh, I've, uh, uh, sorry, I, I just lost my teams. Uh, I, I just think that it's fascinating how, uh, Jack, you've managed to pull out the principles and, and present us with something that we could apply in so many different settings if we understood them. And it is true what Elwin is saying that you just brought the theory and the the the, the characteristics of practice out in 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 your presentation. Uh, I think that somebody said something interesting here, Gerald. He said sometimes our organizations are not safe 
a safe park or a safe space for staff? How can we use some of the principles discussed to transform the environments in which we've worked? And in many ways, when you were presenting, I was also thinking about how sometimes play, when you play when you with your teams, in your team building activities, how much that helps the team connect with each other. And there's so much that we 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 can learn to apply in uh, in 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 that. Uh, uh, Carmen says that play is definitely a way of connecting on the children's level and communicating and thanking you very much for the presentation. Uh, people have been commenting throughout and the comments have demonstrated how they see the characteristics of child and youth care work being demonstrated in play. They're talking about we use play to build uh, to build rapport. People are saying it's an opportunity to teach. Much of what you've been saying, uh, 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 it gives us an opportunity to do and be with children. And uh, I think the comments they need to speak to for themselves, but I see a hand up there. So it would be great to hear someone someone speak. Uh, go right ahead and put on your camera when you speak, if you can. It's a casual, you may speak, yes. Yes, uh, good, af good afternoon, Jack. It's afternoon in, Afri in South Africa. I don't know what is the time out there. And good afternoon to everyone as well. Yeah, um, this work now was uh, very interesting, and it reminded me of some of the uh, the work that we do, especially now we are in schools. And what I picked up is uh, the that the child and youth care worker. We need to understand that at the same time we are leaders. So there are a lot of children who are looking up to us. Uh, families looking up to us as well, because when we present uh, the activities that we do with children in schools, they want to see on how do we respond, how do we uh, interact with them when we work with them. And I like it because uh, we use activities as well just to connect with children, especially in the school settings where you find uh, during breaks, children are for that. During breaks where children um, are, are eating, not all of them are eating. Some are just staying there in the corner. Some they go to uh, the bathrooms. Not the way that they want to do something, but they want to hide themselves from the reality. So during that uh, 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 creating a space to communicate with them, making them to feel welcome as well, making them to understand that we are real people. We are not like the other people as well. It makes them feel like they want to come to us and connect with us on a daily basis. And uh, also right now, in most of the school now, they've reintroduced the, the activities back where the afternoon children will play, children will, uh, will have time to have fun as well. So we use that those kind of a moment to connect with them as well because they see us running around in there. And maybe one of the, uh, the, the the comment we had from one of the principal last week was like, why you guys are always running around everywhere? When I go to the gate, you are there. When I go to the corridor, you are there. In my passage, you are here. In the admin, you are here. You are everywhere. Why don't you sit in the office and then so that children can come to you or will refer them to you? Then uh, our response was like, we, we understand that children um, in the school setting, uh, they have a norm that they are following that. They don't have to go where they're not called. So we understand that they cannot come to us. We have to go to them. We have to, mm -hmm. to play with them during breaks. We have to be there where they are as well. So it helps us to connect as well uh, as a child and youth care workers as well. The, same, the, the, the webinar is helping us to to be able to, to refresh our minds that, um, and also ensure that uh, um, also um, making children sure understand that their experiences, I like uh, the phrase you have put there, that um, experiences are in the, and the stories are in the past, but the future is based on our values and also on our, our principles. That has been so outstanding for me. Thank you so much for the webinar. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, uh, 
Thank you. I don't know if you want to respond there, Jack, or let us just see if there well, are some more questions. Yes. Schools are a very important place for child and youth care workers. And I think, again, the, the principal wants you to put you in an office like a guidance counselor and no one will ever come to see you. Where child care workers know you got to be out in the cafeteria, you got to be out in the playground, and you got to be out in the hallways because that's where you need to create these moments where people can connect with you. So, yeah, very important. It's, it's very good comments. There's just uh, there's just amazing comments in the chat box, and I wish people would speak to them because it's difficult to read all of them out, and many of you are able to. So please do put up your hands and speak. I remember at the beginning of your presentation in your first slides, I just wanted to raise something that that touched me when you talked about like it's very important for us to make a sports and game playing safe. Because as you say, we are in the safe spaces or safe paths. And I remember that uh, that how you select group the groupings of children is very important. I remember in school where they would say, uh, they pick two leaders out and they would say, choose your team. And I always felt, oh my gosh, they're not going to choose me or I'm going to be right. the last person to be picked. And I, you know, I, I, I made sure that when I worked, I never ever did that. But I mean, others might have had similar experiences where you just, you know, it's just even a simple thing like selecting selecting the teams could leave one feeling um, isolated. And while I'm waiting for more hands to uh, to come up, uh, yeah, uh, that that there's no, uh, I think, a point as as interesting that you've made about the safe park as the one that you said when you visited our safe parks, the Izibindi safe parks, and you mentioned that that we must put a boundary around the park. And since then, uh, wherever we've influenced safe parks, we've insisted that there would either be a fence, and if fences were too expensive, it's a bunting, and if a bunting's too complicated to have even an ordinary emergency tape, just string it around a piece of place and you will find that the children feel psychologically safe enough to use the whole space. And that's really helpful. It's also interesting how your principles have transformed the, the reality of safe parks to safe spaces so that, and, and I wonder if people from childcare centers as well as schools can share, have they created safe spaces that, you know, where you don't have the land, you can't put the play equipment, are you still creating safe uh, play spaces for for children? So I'm asking that question to everybody and encouraging you to share your ideas and experiences. Yeah, I don't see see any hands up on this side yet, and I think what what other important comment that uh, the Jack did make is. Uh, it's not the space in specific that's there, but the child and youth care worker is the one that makes the safe park work well. So uh, that experience arranges that we are, and that's where we we need to come in and, and see how we can use the space uh, for the benefit of those that needs us. Okay, thank you. I see now yes. three hands up there. Uh, yes. Lebaon. First and then Bongani and then Venetia. If you could uh, speak in that order, then. Um, yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you um, for the opportunity. Uh, um, just to share more about safe um, space for the kids now. As say, when we talk about safe spaces, we're not only talking about where the play, there's playgrounds for kids where the, um, children need to come and play. But um, creating a safe play, uh, space for a child is like it's where you an environment where the child can be can freely you know ex, um, express themselves and share whatever that is going you know what is going on into their lives. So me having to experience that I've worked at ECBND in the safe parks you know being where the key, the children are playing and you know leveling yourself with with their age not saying that you're an adult but putting yourself in the same age as they are which is give which gives um you know our young people that we're working with more ground to tr first trust you as an adult 
and then yeah so it, it it's it's amazing and then you get to learn more th um things you know from these young people as well so yeah that's for me now sharing about the safe uh, space um with the young people thank you thank you uh, uh, bongani uh, You must unmute Bongani. Bongani speaking. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, let me take the opportunity and thank everyone. Also, I just want to thank uh, Jack for, for the presentation. It was helpful for us as childhood youth care workers because we have experienced a lot from him, what they've uh, shared with us. Because uh, as the child and youth care worker, uh, we are the people who are facing very challenges that uh, many families are looking to us so that we can assist them. Through our modules, we have learned many things as the child and care worker so that we can make it into practice so that we can develop and also to, to transform the experience that we have we have get from, uh, from, the, from our trainings. So as the child and care worker, uh, we have experienced that a uh, safe park is a, is a good place where the young people can build trust. Also, they can experience to share uh, their their problems and their challenges. Because when they are when they have got the space to 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 participate in 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 in, in many activities, it's where we can strengthen and also to to check where the the young people need the support from us. So I just want, I don't want to be long on the, on the, on the presentation because uh, Jack has been spoken so that I just want to thank you for that opportunity. Also, I just want to encourage uh, NACCW to continue have the session like this one because we are very, very, very uh, thankful for that uh, session. Also, we just want to make a, 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 a request to, to have that presentation. I thank you. Thank you. Let's give Anisha a chance before Jack responds. No, I'm, that's fine. I'm fine. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Venisha. Um, thank you, Jack. It, it was really a refresher to remind ourselves <laughs> that we are not just looking after children. Um, I found myself lots of times when people say, now what does a child care worker do? And you, you can't, they can't put their finger on it. What is making this different? Because I, I work in a hospital. So it was basically the first time we're having really child care workers in this hospital. So you're constantly having to explain yourself. Um, but um, for me, when we're talking about the safe spaces, we have like a big, big park. And you must understand it's about maybe 20 children who've got special needs, some in wheelchairs, cognitive um, challenges. Um, and I would take them to the park and it's a major, major park. There's lots of things to do and they would always hover around me and say, go and play. Um, and then I, on another occasion, I would then say, come, let's go for a walk outside of the park, outside of the building. And they thrive on it. And I asked someone once when we were busy doing training, why am I seeing a different child? I mean, it's both outside spaces. They're both being outside. And why is it that they seem calmer when we're walking? Um, you understand, they, they cry if they can't go with. And then she said, sometimes the choices are just too much. The spark was just mm -hmm. massive. There was no, um, uh, you know, like fence in but it was just too many choices for them to make, whereas the walk was there, there was purpose. We're going for a walk, but aunties, they're more engaging, they're busy talking um, kind of thing. So I, I would encourage other people always, you know, when you playing, it's not just playing, yes, there must be purpose um, in it. But I, I, would, I was, it was just interesting for me to see the different um, reactions of the children from when there was this big play park and then from when we were walking. So yeah, just for food for thought for others, but thank you so much for um, the reminder about us 
when we're doing activities, we're planning, we're arranging so many things. And so it gives us lots of theory to explain <laughs> when others, when we are doing things to others who may not understand. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's very important too to know that what's why they feel better walking with you is you create a safe space around you that they're in where when you take to the park and let them run on their own they're not in that safe space anymore so you actually are part of their safe space yeah uh jake do you want to respond to the other two as well or shall we just uh, manage no, more going, for yeah. no. yes okay thank yep. you yes we've got also jubilee uh masibuko and then paul plaiki uh also that want to comment or post questions jubilee over to you okay uh thank you very much uh my comment would be uh today today was actually reminded of the importance of child participation where we hear children's voices about the different activities or games that they would like to play and you know when you are actually heard it creates a safe environment or safe space for children to be able to engage and also to grow and also to build to use to use those strengths as an opportunity for them to grow you know when you are actually heard it it shows that you are also part of whatever that is happening you are involved it becomes so much uh, an, an, an opportunity to grow. I was just also thinking, you know, we were having our, um, as the ECB Nezikolo, a mapping activity where children were mapping out their, the, the, their issues and, and children were mapping out issues like your violence in the community. And from those children's voices, we were able to advocate, you know, during our child protection week. So it gives children an opportunity or sense of you know, being, as you've been saying, in terms of being heard, you know, sharing your part, being part of it. So it, it, it actually stood out for me in terms of, you know, child participation. Thank you. Thank you, Jubilee. <clears throat> Paul, you may unmute. Uh, we we can't hear Mpo. If you could just perhaps uh, speak up. Uh, not sure if you're something wrong with your mic. While I'm pause trying to to unmute, uh, yes. somebody says that you know play assists children to develop their sense of mastery and they're able to show their cognitive abilities. I'm happy I was part of this this topic. Uh, um, the other comment being made is that play helps us contain behaviors of children we are working with and assist to develop social, physical, emotional, cognitive, and spiritual needs. Children are able to experience a sense of togetherness and include in, inclusion. Vanessa is saying, uh, thank you, Jack, for inspiring us with safe parks. So much connection with children and colleagues as well, which uplifts the spirit of children and childcare workers, which is also a debriefing for our childcare workers. Uh, another comment is that this made me remember that play helps us to assist the children we work with to catch up on experience experiences that they missed in their in their earlier lives. I see two hands up, so maybe we'll give them a chance to 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 speak up in the meanwhile. Go ahead, unmute and speak. Uh, Mpo, I, we see Mpo's uh, if unmuted, but. Uh... There's no sound. So we, uh, we will then uh, give Caswell another chance in the meantime. Caswell? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to respond in, in, in the question uh, that was asked by the Do you create a, a safe environment for children in schools or in safe parks? And uh, I'd like to connect with what Jack said that um, when you talk to children, you are talking to uh, their mind. But when you you uh, do things in action, you are actually touching their hearts. So 
what we recently find out is that uh, children are, are tired of talking. They've been talking for so long, and it's just like no one has been listening to them. So what we have introduced in seven years ago is that we are asking children to draw, to put something in drawing that will express on how they feel. That will help us to connect to their hearts as well and find ways on how we're going to address their needs. And we have seen that quite often happening because now children, they can write to letters, uh, they can put things in drawing, and, and that helps us to know this is how children are feeling as well. So when you bring the activities, not every child will speak, not every child will, will participate, but as a child youth care worker, we need to find ways on how can we easily connect with those children. So drawings have been working for us, and I think children now are, are, are becoming, uh, are coming more aware of how do they feel and charging with care with our connection as well. It makes our work to uh, a little bit easier for us to connect with them as well. So during this part, when we are available, it's a part of creating a safe environment for them to express themselves through their drawing as well. And we can interpret it on how best can we, we address their needs as well. Thank you. And and just to take, if I can, uh, uh, chair that that point of of Caswell's forward is that in the mapping and the drawings, we've picked up a lot of children feeling safe in the safe spaces where they've been drawing within the presence of the childcare workers to disclose abuses, and uh, uh, they they were they were telling in drawings issues that were very painful to express in words and allowing the childcare workers to actually engage with them on that if they wanted. I was remembering as well, somebody in the chat box said that that it's 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 a place where uh, uh, children feel safe and they 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 are uh, disclosing abuses. What we found in the Izibendi parks in the old days, that children would come there, feel free to talk about abuses that they've experienced. And what we found once a perpetrator uh, said that, hey, he's going to go down and burn our safe parks because he said that the children go there and he said they tell lies. But what they were doing is that they were we were picking up a lot of uh, 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 historical abuses. So it's quite interesting how therapeutic uh, the safe park and the safe space place can can be. And, and like Caswell said, it's in the corridors and it's in the uh, uh, gate duty in the morning before a child goes to school. And it's in all the other places that children really talk. It's so important for us to be available for them at those times because so many other social service professions don't work children's hours and childcare workers are there then. But there was another hand, so let's have Vanessa speak. Go ahead, Vanessa. And Pilani thereafter. I think Venetia uh, was that speech. She must just lower her hand. Uh, so we will give Pilani a chance. I'm not sure what happened to four. Pilani, you may speak. Afternoon, colleagues. Afternoon. Yeah, it's just a technical contribution. Uh, I missed out on the leadership and sports slides. I was trying to send it as a chat, but I've got a connection problem where I am. Just flighting those two slides, that's all. The conversation is very fruitful. I don't want to spoil a good thing. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we're not clear what you're asking, but uh, we will uh, put the uh, make the presentation also available via the provincial chairpersons. Thank you. Now I was just asking if uh, whoever has a technical support can flight the leadership slide again while we're having a conversation in the background. Oh, oh, I see. I see what you mean. Yeah. Uh, yes, please. Uh, Check the leadership yeah. slide if you could flag it. Yes. Yeah. Leadership and sports slides. Leadership and sports slides. Somebody missed missed that part. Yeah. Are there any oh. other comments and questions while we're putting them up for Pilani? I'm Paul saying that she. Uh, she unmuted, but she doesn't know why. What she wanted to say was thank you to both Jack and NACCW. And is it possible to share the presentation? 
and the one for June that we couldn't attend. So certainly we'll make note of that Malini is here and we will make arrangements for that uh, to, to happen. And somebody is saying, Chair, that we are making a, a, a request to the NACCW to start connecting with other organizations such as NPO, NPC and NGO because we still have more job to begin. I very, I'm very glad that I did join this uh, discussion. It's just very uh, uh, useful and important. Thank you for those uh, comments. Anybody else? We've got Pilani, your hand is still up. Would you like to make another comment? Or is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Oh, sorry, I forgot to put it down. <laughs> That's OK. As somebody is saying as well, Jack, that play can be an escape world for young people, especially young people who come from dysfunctional households. Indeed, play is an important part of child and youth care practice. And they're saying that creating a free space means young people are able to share their challenges and child care workers are skilled enough to be able to handle those challenges that come up, like we've heard with the abuses that come up. They're able to do the appropriate, appropriate referrals and protection. Yeah, another person is saying that safe parks are useful because young people are free to express their talents through activity <coughs> and to build trust with child and youth care workers in a manner to express their problems and challenges. And I was just thinking to myself that your point as well, when we run these activities and all of us in different ways are doing it, do we do we do a reflection on your points that you made, Jack? You know, have we created connection? Have we created discovery? Have we created empowerment? I was almost thinking if we could put that together in a little word so that people remember, you know, a CDE is a bit is a bit <laughs> hard to remember. Maybe. Uh, uh, DEC deck and maybe come on people let's actually use the deck approach when we are working with children did we create empowerment uh, 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 discovery empowerment and connection maybe that will help us remember it because that kind of self uh, uh, reflection and assessment is so is so important yeah go ahead if somebody has your hand up or just speak or read out your comment okay I don't see any other hands. Uh, anyone that still want to comment or make a question? Uh, maybe Jack and then uh, flight the other one on sport. Uh, if yes. It was the other request, Jack, that we fly yes. that slide on sport. Yes, and maybe think, some comments, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the other important uh, aspect that we uh, perhaps it's a challenge that we should take up there in our provinces, uh, especially us that lives in the in the cities, because the municipality also, you know, they build these parks and some of them have got beautiful fences around them. It's a play area, but there's nothing happening. Sometimes it's just the grass growing and uh, sometimes more adults go and sit on these benches and children don't have a chance to do things. And maybe we should take this, you know, in our uh, networks and go and discuss there with, you know, with our municipalities and their different departments, whatever, to see how we as child and youth care workers could also use that because it's a resources, uh, you know, that they put in the IDP to give us, uh, you know, and give us funding. Uh, also to be able to do more community activities there. Uh, so I put it to our chairpersons to put it on your agenda and our discussions uh, so that we can involve our, our uh, you know, our local municipalities and our councillors and these people because we want to also create more safe spaces for children and we could, uh, uh, program today shared with us how we can use uh, the various activities and sport and dance and music to develop and speak to the hearts of children and help them you know to bring about the jack used that a big word uh, cognitive dissonance 
Uh, so we've learned a lot of uh, new concepts here to as uh, takeaways. Yeah. Uh, any other comments? Uh, yes. Just to follow up, Chair, on, on yes. the point you made, do you think that the NACCW and the NEC can take that forward? Because I think you're making a very valid point that what about our public parks? What about parks and recreation and local government? Can we not do some advocacy to ask whether they could employ child and youth care workers in local government and in parks and recreations, employ them in parks so that we provide that kind of support for them? because the safe park can be a standalone model and it can be developed. And that could be a, a wonderful way forward from this presentation as well, because I think it it holds a job opportunity uh, uh, for child and youth care workers as well. So I think you're making a very valid point. Thank you. Yeah, we would like to hear from our chairpersons also. I think I saw a Jubilee, uh, uh, made a comment there. Maybe she wants to share about her experience. I only see people commenting their good uh, ideas. Thank you. Uh, we also want to hear your voices. I, I I feel I feel like we 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 we've got so much of information on the Thank safe you. park model that we've developed. We've got Jack here who's done a a presentation, an international guest reflecting on the safe park as well. We've got a, a book now that's been written on activities. We've got enough to uh, you know under our arms to go to do this advocacy with the with parks and recreation and. Uh, uh, municipalities and local government uh, chair. I'm, I'm glad that people think it's a good idea. So maybe we can join hands on this. 